Good morning, everyone, and I uh, welcome you to Friday morning virtual um, thyroid journal club. Um, uh, it is really a pleasure to introduce our two speakers this morning. Uh, the first is Susan Pitt, who is an assistant professor of surgery at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health in Madison. Um, Dr. Pitt's clinical practice focuses on endocrine diseases of the thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal glands. Susan is an NIH-funded researcher whose focus is um, uh, in trying to align the treatment decisions of patients with low-risk thyroid cancer with their goals and priority. Um, uh, she has over 50 peer-reviewed publications. And uh, we are honored today to have Anna Sokka um, be the discussant. Uh, she is a well-known endocrinologist and clinical scientist at the University Health Network in Toronto. Um, she's also an associate professor at the University of Toronto. Um, and just by way of background, after completing a fellowship in endocrinology at the Mayo Clinic, um, she then completed her PhD degree in clinical epidemiology and biostatistics at McMaster University. Um, Anna has held a Canadian Institute of Health Research uh, New Investigator Award, um, which was then followed by a Cancer Care Ontario Health Services Research Chair and the University of Toronto Department of Medicine Clinician Scientist Merit Award. Um, her research is focused in, the, in thyroid cancer and specifically um, at this time she is supported by grants from the Canadian Institute of Health Research and cancer, Canadian Cancer Society Research Associate Institute. Um, she's primarily focused on the topic for this morning uh, related to thyroid cancer treatment and outcomes, um, thyroid cancer survivorship issues and medical decision making in thyroid cancer. Um, and issues related to distress and quality of life um, as, it, uh, it, as it relates to thyroid disorders and thyroid cancer survivors. Um, so we have two really outstanding presentations on this topic, um, and I want to encourage everyone who's listening to write in your questions, and we'll try to do our best to get to those um, at the end of, before the end of the hour. Um, I do want to mention that our session is generously sponsored by Lilly Oncology, um, and so our um, thanks to them. And so with that, um, Susan, if you'll be able to uh, get us started here, and thank you all for attending. Thank you um, so much for that kind introduction. Um, it's such an honor to be speaking to everyone this morning, and um, it's uh, an, uh, I'd like to thank the Think Foundation as well uh, for the opportunity uh, to present. Um, I have no disclosures um, uh, with regard to this uh, data. Um, this uh, paper that I'm going to be presenting was published in uh, 2019 uh, in the Journal of Surgical Research and is about the qualitative um, needs of patients with papillary thyroid cancer. And I'm just going to give a little introduction to start with um, in terms of you know, where the, the thought about doing this and the rationale for doing this study uh, came from. Um, we all know that these data were published um, several years ago now in JAMA, but were some of the first to really highlight the thyroid cancer epidemic um, in the United States, um, which we all know from uh, data that have been published uh, is not just in the United States, but is worldwide. And a lot of the increase in the incidence of um, thyroid cancer, as you can see, is um, papillary. And one of the reasons why I showed this is because our um, study focused on patients with papillary thyroid cancer. Um, we also know that the mortality um, of of patients has stayed, you know, relatively stable. There's a little bit of a debate, I think, about how stable and, you know, for which patients, but overall um, that has remained, even though these data are uh, now almost 18 years old. Um, I think the problem with all of this is that that incidence increased. There's a growing number of survivors. In the United States alone, there's over 800 thyroid cancer survivors. That number is, I know, at least a year old, so I'm sure that it's you know growing daily um, and is uh, even higher now. And so what happens, though, when we have a, a large pool of thyroid cancer you know, survivors, um, when we've looked at studying survivorship, we know a few things. One, that these patients have been shown to have decreased quality of life. Um, I'm highlighting just two papers here um, that have uh, looked at the quality of life in thyroid cancer survivors compared to both other cancer survivors um, and to uh, U.S. normative data, and it's in general been similar or worse to other cancer survivors and definitely worse to uh, 
uh, the normal U.S. population. Patients have also been shown to have a lot of unmet needs. And a lot of the studies that have published on this have looked at survivorship as opposed to the needs preoperatively. Um, however, survivors frequently will report that they had um, unmet, unmet needs in that sort of preoperative period between the time of diagnosis and then later their um, actual treatment and survivorship. And so the rationale for this study really was that one, there's some prospective data that need to be collected where we can really comprehensively understand patients' needs and values as they're actually occurring because there's always hindsight bias and other biases from studying things retrospectively. Um, I think the other is that identifying patients' needs and values can really improve um, our ability to actually support these patients. Um, you know, I've just sort of sh shown a little uh, picture there at the bottom with different, you know, core needs that people have, you know, um, food and water and shelter and things like that. Um, but I think we need to think beyond those um, in our patients. And so the aim of the study was really to characterize the preoperative experience with patients with thyroid cancer, but focusing on their needs and values. Um, and so we did this um, by uh, using a study of patients that was already uh, ongoing. So patients were um, 18 years of older, they had greater than one centimeter or equal to uh, papillary thyroid cancer or suspicious for cancer. Um, they were clinically node negative and had no evidence of metastases. And then they were participating in a randomized clinical trial. So you can say that there's probably some bias uh, in who we chose to study, but it was a good sampling frame uh, for us. Um, and so the actual intervention in the trial that they were undergoing was um, a total thyroidectomy. And then we were looking at uh, prophylactic central neck dissection. So patients were being randomized to either a total thyroid with or a total thyroid without an ipsilateral prophylactic central neck dissection. And that study just for sort of, you know, full disclosure, and this was really part of that study um, from the outset, um, was to look at, you know, complication rates, cancer outcomes, and impact on quality of life. And so if you look at a sort of time frame of data collection, you can see on the left for the little graphic that patients, you know, would go undergo their FNA and, and biopsy and, and get their diagnosis. They would then see a surgeon in consultation and be consented for the randomized uh, clinical trial. And then sometimes between there and surgery is when the interview occurred. And we did semi-structured interviews. Um, they were all performed by trained non-clinical staff. They lasted about an hour, but ranged from 45 to 120 minutes. They were done in a convenient neutral location. So we didn't do these immediately in clinic right afterwards. Um, we wanted patients to be able to be comfortable, have a little bit of time to think about um, what their needs and priorities were. Um, they ranged anywhere from the actual day of um, consent to 67 days later, and patients um, were asked open-ended questions with a piloted um, guide. So the guide actually um, went through a few, I think it was about four different patients, um, and um, they um, were not included in the final analysis. Um, and the questions, we didn't ask directly, like, what are your needs and, you know, what are your values, but we tried to ask questions around, that would get around those um, themes. And so um, we asked about patients' experience with their diagnosis, um, experiences they had with their surgeon. Um, we also asked about advice you would give your surgeon or another patient. And sort of uh, the uh, thought behind those types of questions are that then people will tell you about like things that they wish had gone differently or what they really did or didn't like and value about that. Um, we also about, asked about communication with the care team. Um, the interviews were transcribed and de-identified, and then the coding process um, was started um, by initially coding about eight transcripts till we identified a coding framework, um, which we did iteratively revise throughout the process. Um, and then we used constant comparison to identify sort of emerging codes and themes, um, and a trained uh, team of coders uh, coded everything with a good um, uh, inter-reader reliability. Um, and then the analysis was really a content analysis that focused on um, needs and values, and we stopped when we felt like our themes were saturated. Um, this table is from the uh, study itself, and it showed that we uh, interviewed a total of 32 patients. They were, uh, on average, about 47 years old, and um, most were female um, and Caucasian. Um, I, we did have several um, well-educated patients, which, you know, is... Uh, indicative of our population here in Madison, uh, Wisconsin, where a lot of people work for the university. Um, and uh, we had several patients, you can see a little bit down lower, um, who had um, you know, family history of cancer and a few who had a personal history of cancer as well. When we put all of our data together, this was sort of the model that 
we came up with. Um, patients had sort of three really strong needs um, that include this informational support that they really wanted to be individualized. Um, it included emotional support um, where they was really characterized by validation and empathy. Um, and they uh, wanted to be treated and respected as an individual. And when those needs were met, there was a strong you know, patient-surgeon relationship that developed um, and there was a lot of trust. I'll say from the outset here, you know, because of the way the study was designed and the questions they focused on surgeons, but I think a lot of the same uh, themes would be true uh, for endocrinologists as well. Um, and they also wanted this information to be coming from their healthcare provider. You know, misinformation on the internet was a big theme. Um, and ultimately when these were all met, um, patients felt reassured. And so I'm gonna go through each one of the sort of major needs one by one um, and show you some of the quotes. Um, from the study. This table really goes over all of them and I'm gonna go through it one by one. I know it's a lot of data all on one side, so I won't focus on it for uh, very long. So in terms of emotional support, or sorry, informational support, patients wanted to know about all aspects of care. I'm sure we all know this, um, that patients ask about everything from their diagnosis to their treatment options. They wanna know details related to surgery um, and post-operative care. And when they've had this information was adequately um, you know, addressed and met, then they had a lot of peace of mind. They felt uh, more at ease. But when they felt as though they lacked information, there was a lot of talk about distress. And if you look at the um, couple of quotes um, that are here, um, they'll uh, show you basically that um, patients said, you know, telling me about surgery really helped me understand. Um, I felt much more relaxed and fearful. They said things um, like, you know, the surgeon went over all the options. I was comfortable for someone who was told they just had cancer. Um, there were also some themes around questions. Um, people really wanted to be able to ask and have adequate time for questions. Um, one particular patient asked a lot of questions about her voice and had a lot of voice concerns. And so she felt very reassured just knowing the details about, you know, getting the vocal cord out of the way, which we know isn't quite the way that it's um, done. Um, and another, when they were asked about what advice would you give to another patient said, learn everything that you can. It comes back to being able to ask questions. When we look at emotional support um, and the emotional support needs, um, patients really talked about uh, wanting to feel kind of heard and listened to by the surgeon. Um, you know, the, if you look at the quotes on the right here, they said things like the surgeon was very caring and professional. Um, so that made me feel less worried or the surgeon did a great job at being thorough and sensitive, taking the time to listen. Um, and in, they just wanted this sense that they would be just fine, that they wanted reassurance. Um, however, when that was not met, what they did, if they had lack of support, they really felt much more anxious. Um, and this is just a, one more kind of quote that they wanted a lot of this support, whether it was information or emotional support to be individualized. Um, and so this is a quote from one patient who said, they're all so compassionate. They make you feel like you're the only patient, which is really nice. Like they know you as a person. And then the last main uh, need that we saw was that treatment as an individual. And we thought a lot as we were um, going through developing our model, was that its own need in and of itself, or was it just needs sort of within the informational and emotional support? But we realized that they, patients really did want to be seen as a unique person. They wanted that personalized approach because talking in, in, in um, generalizations and not meeting this need, a lot of them talked about how that felt um, very discounting. Um, if you look at the quotes that are up here, you know, patients, you know, in, in terms of giving advice to a future patient, one said, make a relationship with the surgeon so that when they're cutting your throat, you're not that individual that, or not the eighth patient we've done today. And so that they, you know, actually know and, and see you. Um, people who had voice um, uh, prominent um, and dependent professions really appreciated um, uh, individualized talk about um, what we would do to, you know, preserve their superior laryngeal or recurrent laryngeal nerves. Um, Another quote that I'll highlight here is, um, you know, someone had said when they were giving advice to a surgeon, whatever generalization you're doing, make it specific for what you're seeing in this individual. Um, and so we really felt as this was its own sort of uh, theme within everything. And ultimately, when those needs were met, patients talked, um, you know, a lot about how um, much they um, appreciated their relationship with their surgeon, their trust in their surgeon, how much they had confidence, and just that general feeling of being reassured made that relationship stronger. Um, 
And uh, ultimately, that then would lead to reassurance. And so, you know, patients felt as though their doubts and fears they talked a lot about were removed. They talked about things like feeling more comfortable, confident, calmer, and ready to go. But when this wasn't met, when there was sort of even just one of these um, different pieces uh, in our little model on the left there, um, patients described feeling worried or unsettled, anxious, or minimized. And so you now are probably uh, spinning and, uh, you know, either falling asleep, thinking of thyroids, or just, you know, overwhelmed by a lot of the different quotes that we've shown, which is different from qualitative uh, data. And so to summarize um, all of this, um, you know, patients um, with thyroid cancer really desired this strong patient-surgeon relationship in the preoperative peri peri uh, period. Um, and that was really more of, I think, a value than an absolute need, but um, it wasn't something that, um, I think we would have seen if we had done a different type of study, um, you know, like surveyed patients or something like that. Um, and patients really relied on the surgeon to provide adequate um, emotional and informational support um, while respecting them as an individual. So they wanted both individualized information, individualized emotional support, but they also just wanted to be seen for their unique characteristics. Like, you know, I'm a farmer. We have a lot of farmers here in Wisconsin. And, you know, therefore, I, you need to realize how you know, having surgery on this cancer is going to affect my ability to go back and whether it's a dairy farm and milk cows or these sorts of things. And they really wanted us to see, you know, all their different attributes um, and take those into account when we are making our, uh, whether it's, you know, recommendations for treatment or just, um, you know, a care plan. Um, and when these needs were met, they really felt reassured and prepared for treatment. Um, and I think this part really summarizes what we found, but I think ultimately the question is, well, knowing what we know now um, from doing this study, how does this have like implications for the future? Um, so I've highlighted a few clinical implications here that I think are important to think about going forward. Um, one is that when patients have a strong relationship with their surgeon or I think any healthcare provider, people, you know, have a lot of trust and confidence. And I think, um, you know, data that have come from uh, Dr. Saka's uh, group has showed that this can really facilitate decision making and support. Um, and that may, is very key for, you know, decisions where people are considering less or non-invasive options, like active surveillance or even lobectomy, you know, all the patients in our study did undergo um, either a total thyroidectomy with or without um, a central neck dissection. And so, you know, we weren't specifically looking at decision making, but I think that there are implications when uh, you take into the account this relationship and some other data that we've collected uh, since doing this study uh, that really shows that if, you know, someone really trusts uh, and has confidence in their provider, uh, that that can change their decision making um, or influence it heavily. Um, I think the other is that there's a lot of data in patients with other cancers about um, needs. Um, and when you go, kind of parse through the literature, some of the things that really stand out are that um, meeting patients' needs is actually associated with improved health uh, related quality of life. Um, and in some, especially more aggressive cancers, it's improved, uh, uh, it's associated with improved outcomes, even things like survival. And so I think we have an opportunity to really impact survivorship, but starting in the, you know, preoperative period, it starts from how we, you know, meet patients day one and support them throughout their whole experience. And there are some data that show that people who don't feel supported early on never totally recover um, and, and maybe it's something innate to those um, uh, patients, but I do think that we have an opportunity uh, to impact patients' lives. Um, so I really want to acknowledge, uh, especially Dr. Sipple, um, you know, most uh, or this data was um, all collected as part of her randomized uh, control trial R01 um, funded, and I know she's presented about that to this group. Um, as well as sort of the other uh, key investigators, her co-PI, Dr. Connor, and um, Dr. McDonald and uh, Boyles were some of our qualitative specialists who really taught uh, me how to do qualitative research um, as I didn't have a background in this. Um, and then, you know, we couldn't do this without our clinical partners, um, both uh, the surgeons as well as our, uh, you know, ENT and endocrinology uh, colleagues. And then a lot of researchers um, put uh, some uh, time into this uh, work. So I'd like to thank them too. Um, and I look forward to the discussion and all of the questions. Dr. Saka is going to go ahead now and um, do a discussion of uh, the paper. Thank you all for your time.
Hello. Um, my screen doesn't, oh, there we go. Um, so thank you, uh, first of all, thank you to the thank organizers for inviting me to be a discussant and thank you, Susan, for uh, presenting your paper and, and for the uh, kind introduction. And I'm not going to um, uh, spend a, a lot of time uh, kind of reiterating a lot of what Susan said about her research because she's really the best person to talk about that. I, I thought maybe I'd kind of talk around that a little bit and then kind of bring it back to the paper and uh, we can talk a little bit about um, why this research uh, is important. So um, as uh, stated previously, my, I'm an endocrinologist. So, you know, if we're talking about patient-surgeon uh, relationship, I'm not really in a position to kind of comment on that. Um, I can't comment on patient and, and, and doctor uh, relationship, but there may be aspects that are sort of um, uh, not directly relevant to kind of the kind of care I give. Um, and the other thing just to sort of mention is um, Dr. Erkin had kindly introduced me and, and indicated I have an epidemiology degree. And the reality is that most of my methodologic training really has been focused on numbers. So it's, uh, it's quantitative research and this is a different kind of research. So I'm, I'm, I don't consider myself an expert in this area. I'm uh, very, um, uh, I'm still learning about qualitative research if we put it that way. And I've worked with qualitative researchers, but this is, uh, this is something that I think is relatively new to our field. We, had, uh, we have done some qualitative aspects to our research as well. And I think it's something that will grow in our area. And so it's important for us to know about. So I have no uh, relevant disclosures, just uh, some uh, academic uh, funding. So first of all, why, why do we need to uh, identify unmet needs? Because that's really, uh, even though um, uh, the questions in this paper weren't really directing people to say, what is your unmet need? That was really what the, uh, what the implication was and what was the title. And this is the preoperative uh, needs of patients with uh, papillary thyroid cancer. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about unmet needs, and this is kind of a little more in my domain um, that uh, Susan had briefly alluded to. We can go in a little more detail with respect to uh, what the quantitative research has said to date. We'll talk a little bit about what is qualitative research. I mean, we've just been presented with this data. This, uh, For some people, this might actually be the first time reading a qualitative paper. And so just having a little bit of a background or framework about that may be helpful in terms of putting the results in perspective. Um, we'll briefly discuss the paper and we'll summarize some conclusions. So in terms of um, uh, identifying uh, unmet needs in uh, health services delivery, Unmet need uh, identifies areas where patient care is, uh, oh, sorry, just moving my um, compromised and has the potential to negatively affect patients' well being. So, this is really uh, in terms of a global kind of uh, consideration of health, which includes uh, quality of life. Um, so, where a patient identifies some deficiency. Uh, that we can actually provide in care and we and we can potentially improve their um, not only their health in terms of clinical health outcomes but also uh, well-being and quality of life and knowledge of unmet needs is actually important for health policymakers as it may enable prioritizing which unmet needs should be addressed first for better targeting of health and support services and particularly uh, in cancer care. So um, let's talk a little bit about unmet information and support needs of thyroid cancer patients and survivors. I'm not going to be going into unmet sort of clinical needs uh, or uh, sort of societal needs, uh, inter the clinical needs, for example, uh, new treatments that may be curative for patients with metastatic uh, disease or, um, or societal needs where we know there are health disparities um, in the provision of um, healthcare services to thyroid cancer patients. But um, this is uh, really kind of more on an individual um, uh, patient level, um, ident identifying into pa individual patient uh, information needs as they relate to their going through their trajectory of cancer, um, uh, uh, decision-making and treatment, and uh, also uh, long-term follow-up and disease surveillance. 
and the support uh, supportive care needs. So this is a summary of some quantitative studies. And we had uh, done a systematic review previously. And actually, the first study um, that quantitatively examined unmet thyroid cancer patient information and support needs was published by Dr. Erkin. And this was in 2008. He did a, a survey of 62 thyroid cancer patients. Uh, where patients were asked to rate on, I believe it was a scale of one to five, the adequacy of the information they received related to their disease and aspects of care and support. And, and he um, identified some unmet information needs related to recurrence um, and uh, new treatments. And also, um, this was important, was unmet supportive care needs relating to uh, emotional support, uncertainty about the future, fear of recurrence, uh, and others. So really, it was Dr. Erkin who, um, in his initial survey, was the first to really kind of bring this to light in a thyroid cancer field. Um, uh, certainly, there is literature dating back now about two decades um, in the general oncology literature, but really had not been sort of recognized um, in our area prior to this. Okay. Whoops. So. And um, following Dr. Erkin's um, uh, uh, study, there has been additional, again, these are um, all sort of cross-sectional uh, survey studies. This was a large study that was uh, Rita Banik, who um, was actually head of Thyroid Cancer Canada uh, at the time, uh, did a survey with the Thyroid Cancer Alliance International Organization on psychosocial and informational support needs. Uh, as well as um, uh, treatments and, and side effects and, and looked at different, uh, how things differed in different countries. Uh, they had a large sample size of thyroid cancer survivors, uh, almost 2,400 patients globally. And um, they had some targeted questions uh, and where they, uh, as opposed to rating, it was more of a kind of a yes, no uh, uh, response. And they had indicated that 63% of patients um, who um, had, these were patients who had already undergone treatment, had never really received any clear written disease or treatment information. And moreover, um, 90, almost 93% indicated that they never had any psychological or professional support. Many never received any referrals to, um, to uh, support organizations such as this one as well, which was uh, relevant to these um, uh, investigators. And so, um, essentially, uh, this reiterated the observation by uh, Dr. Erkin that we needed to improve both information and psychosocial support for thyroid cancer patients um, and survivors. And this is on a global scale. Um, subsequently, Olga Hewson, um, who's an investigator in the Netherlands, um, surveyed 306 patients who were enrolled in the IDOVIN uh, cancer registry. She had an excellent response rate, actually 86% for this survey. And uh, she indicated that thyroid cancer survivors, again, these were patients who had largely completed their treatment and were in follow-up, reported receiving no or only a little information about their disease, but this was uh, variable um, uh, uh, depending on the type of uh, information, 27 to 86%, medical tests, treatments, and um, aftercare. And 47% um, of survivors were not at all or only a little satisfied with the information they received. So basically, more than half of uh, or about almost half of individuals really felt like they didn't get enough information um, about their disease. Melanie Goldfarb um, from the United States then looked at um, an interesting comparison of young adolescent and young adult uh, thyroid cancer survivors. So these were individuals under 40 years of age. Um, compared to thyroid cancer survivors that were 40 years or older. This was an online survey conducted through the FICA support group website. Um, she also had a large sample size of over a thousand individuals. And interestingly, she uh, reported that there were some differences with respect to young people, patient, younger patients and the older patients in that younger patients reported less commonly receiving information regarding recurrence, long-term side effects, coping support groups, meeting survivors or treatment decisions. 
And um, young adolescent and young adult thyroid cancer su uh, survivors also reported receiving less overall care for emotional and psychosocial concerns compared to older survivors. Now, the latter is important to also consider in the context of the general oncology and psycho-oncology literature, in that we know that young individuals with cancer generally have a greater need for, uh, uh, they have greater emotional and psychosocial distress related to their cancer compared to older individuals in general, and, uh, and the support needs are actually greater. So it wouldn't be surprising that patients would be less satisfied in that group uh, but in any case, there were deficiencies sort of across the board, but it was particularly um, more noticeable in the younger individuals diagnosed with uh, thyroid cancer. And then um, in 2016, we had actually uh, looked at this literature and we did a systematic review of unmet information and psychosocial support needs because we felt like there was a body of literature growing that just kind of needed to be summarized and, and sort of brought to the surface a bit more. Um, we had reviewed uh, over 1900 citations, 51 papers. This uh, work was thanks to the hard work of um, tra uh, trainees um, and uh, uh, including um, a pre-med student and a uh, endocrinology fellow, uh, two endocrinology fellows. Um, and so we, this was an unfunded study um, again, we reviewed all the literature we could find in a systematic fashion, um, and we this the actually we found seven studies which totaled over 6,000 thyroid cancer survivors in terms of their sample sizes. Now these were all cross-sectional studies, so they were not uh, serial evaluations of patients. There was no qualitative data; it was all quantitative uh, survey data. Everyone was using different surveys, and there were certainly methodologic issues. Uh, including potential for recall bias, as Susan had mentioned. So patients may recollect things differently um, uh, in the past than they really were. Uh, but overall, there were high rates across the board um, of unmet needs regarding aftercare. So after you've had your operation and being uh, followed, as well as psychosocial concerns. And interestingly, there was variability among the studies in terms of how much unmet need there was regarding information about the disease, diagnostic tests, coordination care, and treatments. So it looked like different institutions, uh, there may have been some variability of care and how these services were uh, provided and how information was provided among institutions, which actually could have implications for trying to sort of more uh, standardize it and have some common uh, resources. But clearly the psychosocial concerns, as Dr. Erkin noticed in 2008, uh, was really a prevailing theme that's come um, over and over and over again. Now, these are all quantitative studies, there's surveys, there's numbers, and this is not really uh, what uh, Susan has just presented. Um, and I just wanted to give a very brief introduction to qualitative research. I'm not personally a qualitative researcher myself, but um, these are sort of, I think, some important points that we can kind of take. So in terms of qualitative research, um, the qualitative approach uh, uh, really evaluates patients' perception. So it's really, you know, from the viewpoint of the individual. And it focuses on developing in-depth understanding. So that's very important that it's in-depth, whereas with a survey, you may be doing sort of a more superficial sort of quick rating or, or uh, measurement. Um, but understanding of an individual's experience their attitudes and behavior. So of course it's inherently subjective, but from the perspective of the patient. And it gives emphasis to giving meaning and participant views. And um, this is particularly important when, you know, we may have standardized questionnaires or non-standardized questionnaires that we make. We may not necessarily think of even the right questions to ask patients about things that are important to them relating to um, their experience. And this really allows participants to kind of share more broadly and in-depth things that are important um, to them. 
And the qualitative approach is different from the quantitative approach. In quantitative research, we typically ask who, what, where, uh, how much, um, and here we're looking at more why and, and how does that all happen. And so it's really looking at things from a different um, uh, perspective, and I think it's important to appreciate that, that it's um, a different way of doing research. Um, in terms of some differences from qualitative and quantitative uh, research, I'm not going to go through uh, all of them here, but uh, basically I think some important concepts are with quantitative research, we've got numbers and they verif uh, they, we've, we're basically verifying some hypotheses. With qualitative research, we're developing concepts. So similar to that, you know, framework that, Sus uh, that Susan had presented, these are concepts, themes are being extracted, concepts and theories are being developed based on the data that's, that's flowing from these uh, patient participants. And again, we want to know why this is happening and, and, and what, what really is going on, the process. It's a more natural setting, so patients are being interviewed. We don't uh, give him a standardized, you know, pencil and paper questionnaire with numbers. Um, it's very important to note that actually this sample sizes are, um, you don't really need as many patients as you would for um, quantitative research. And so the sample size here was more than ample. It was 30, 32. And uh, typically qualitative re research, maybe 20 to 30 patients, uh, depending on uh, the design and um, uh, uh, of the study. But you don't actually necessarily need a lot of patients, but that's also in the context of the sampling, because what you want to do is, uh, rather than getting a random uh, sample or maybe everyone in a population, um, what enables you to actually get more information is a purposeful sampling. So you may sample by age, uh, by gender, by certain characteristics, for example, patients who had had a disease recurrence, and that actually allows you to uh, select numbers of patients from different kind of um, pre-specified uh, categories and sort of look at um, and, and potentially compare uh, how they uh, respond to the same kind of open-ended questions, which may be very different and informative. The approach is less, not so deductive, but more inductive. It's interpretive. And rather than testing a hypothesis, um, it's actually hypothesis generating, may actually generate uh, further research, which may, which may include quantitative research, such as testing um, an intervention. The researcher obviously is very involved in terms of um, uh, interviews, coding, and interpreting uh, the results. So I thought this was um, kind of important to share with people in case you're not familiar with uh, qualitative research, uh, as it is a different way of thinking. Now, Susan had already uh, uh, presented uh, uh, her paper, and I'm not going to go into uh, all the nitty uh, gritty because she's she's done that uh, in a lovely way. Um, and this was a qualitative study where they did semi-structured interviews um, preoperatively with 32 patients with uh, thyroid cancer. They were all N0 disease, and they were enrolled in an RCT of thyroidectomy with or without central neck dissection. So these people, um, I believe, had all already consented to surgery. Uh, so it really, um, uh, they were uh, being assessed at a common time point where they had met with the surgeon, had their consultation, um, and uh, actually uh, not yet had their surgery which is actually important because a lot of the uh, uh, studies that have been previously done in the qualitative literature, which I won't go through in detail, have been uh, more cross-sectional studies of survivors. So this was uh, a very kind of uh, important time point to talk with patients. Patients were interviewed by non-clinical staff and transcribed per verbatim. So their doctor who did the counseling was not the person who would be uh, doing the interview, which is important. And there was four team members who reviewed this, the subset of transcripts. So these would be typically uh, audio recorded, transcribed, and the uh, framework of these uh, of coding would be developed, uh, which would lead to sort of ultimately development of the themes. The constant comparative method was used in coding to integrate these emerging themes that were coming out of these quotations from patients, and they had high intercoder reliability. 
Now, Susan um, had already outlined um, the themes and concepts that they identified, which um, uh, does actually support sort of the background um, uh, with respect to the existing quantitative literature and some qualitative literature, although, as I mentioned before, there's, this is really the first study to evaluate patients at this kind of time point preoperatively. So essentially, uh, there was a need for informational support, emotional support, and uh, uh, respect for individuality. Um, the authors interpreted this as uh, all contributing to a strong patient-surgeon relationship and reassurance. Um, I think in the end as well uh, is, uh, although the, one would need to sort of follow people uh, in the longer term, the question is, it, it, this is reassurance preoperatively, but what you'd want to see is actually um, uh, reflecting in terms of long-term uh, uh, patient uh, satisfaction and improved outcomes in terms of their uh, well-being. And she's already described the uh, quotes uh, it was, uh, in a uh, lovely fashion, so I'm not going to sort of go into that. Um, I wanted to just, uh, there are some checklists that one can do, even uh, systematic reviews of qualitative research, and there's some quality checklists, and I'm not going to go through those. I think that would be a little uh, too much. Uh, and uh, But I just wanted to highlight what I think are some of the strengths of this um, research and also some of the limitations. Um, and so in terms of the strengths, I think the authors really did an excellent job describing their population, including uh, the timing of when these patients were uh, recruited preoperatively, the demographic characteristics. Um, and uh, so we really had a good sense of kind of who these patients were um, uh, uh, and uh, can identify that with our own practices. Uh, there was a dedicated qualitative methodologist, or more than one, uh, involved in the study, which is very important um, in terms of uh, considering methodologic standards. The process of interviewing patients for the study was very well des described, including some of the description of the questions that were posed, the interview duration, etc. So we have a good idea of what, how the investigators in this study approached the patients in terms of eliciting uh, the data. Um, the authors utilized standardized qualitative techniques for data collection, and uh, so per verbatim transcription and analysis, standardized software, et cetera. And how they arrived at their themes was well described, and they also uh, provided sample quotations, which is important, um, and these supported uh, the themes that they had um, derived. An important concept in qualitative research is data saturation. So you really sort of stop sampling or, or stop your study once you achieve data saturation, where you're essentially reiterating the same themes over and over and over again as you recruit more patients. And the authors did report that they had achieved data saturation, and um, so that's actually a very important point. Now, there's also limitations, um, uh, and uh, essentially, uh, as would be with any research. So, you know, one of the nice things about the study is they had this very well-described um, uh, population, but it was actually a very sort of focused population of relatively low risk disease. So we really don't know about patients with node positive or high risk cancers or patients on the other end of the spectrum that may have, for example, microcarcinoma and are considering active surveillance. So, so these findings may limit some of the generalizability to those other types of thyroid cancer populations. And the authors did mention that as a limitation in their discussion. Uh, I'm not a qualitative methodologist, but usually you uh, there are more methodologic orientation or theory is described somewhere in the methods like grounded theory or others, um, and I just didn't see that reported. Um, uh, and uh, so usually that's kind of a quality criterion to sort of uh, put in a sentence about that at least. Um, uh, surgical uh, counsel counseling and consultation process. I think this is an important uh, piece that I was left kind of wondering about. So um, I understood that the patients had met with a surgeon, uh, they had received counseling and had consented to surgery. What I couldn't really derive from the paper is 
was it one surgeon? Was it multiple surgeons? Were there surgical trainees involved? What was the process of that consultation? Did the surgeons provide patients with any written or online resources? And so I didn't really uh, feel like I had a good sense of what was the information that was provided to these patients. And if it was given by multiple surgeons, then you know how what was common about it was it the same um and so i just was left a little bit wondering what the information piece was which was really sort of one of the key findings uh, in the study was um actually unmet needs related to that so i think that would be um sort of helpful to better understand and maybe susan can can tell us more about that that would be um of great interest um, also, I think it's important, you know, the doctor-surgeon, the, the patient-surgeon relationship is obviously immensely important, but there are other staff that are uh, can be involved. Uh, for example, uh, nurses, including uh, there can be uh, advanced care nurses in on oncology clinics or surgical clinics, uh, trainees, other MDs like uh, endocrinologists or other specialists or primary care physicians. Um, psychosocial oncology if they tend to be involved in the care of these patients. So it wasn't really clear to me if uh, what the interactions were and if there was sort of any standardization of that in terms of a process of, of care. For example, if every patient met with an advanced care nurse and the surgeon, that would be something important to, uh, to, to know. Um, so it would just be nice to know a little bit more about that. Maybe Susan can tell us about that. Um, another um, aspect that also relates to, again, the surgical consultation is, you know, we know what the patients perceived as, uh, as being said or not said or their unmet needs, particularly relating to the information needs, but we really don't know what was actually said because um, I didn't see any uh, evidence of audio or video recording of the surgical consultations or even a subset of them which would be uh, fascinating to actually uh, explore. And, and uh, there is some research in, in oncology where um, sometimes what patients remember uh, of interactions and what was actually on uh, a recorded video may not necessarily be the same. And sometimes uh, it can be an overwhelming process and patients may forget some things that were actually said. Uh, and so I think that that would be actually uh, quite informative and maybe that would be a follow-up study if it hasn't been done uh, to, to look at that. And I guess uh, another thing that would be very interesting to look at would be, you know, they actually didn't recruit, I think it was about 75% women and mean age was, uh, uh, I think it was 47 and standard deviation of 12. So what would have been really interesting to sort of dig into this data and I'm thinking more in terms of uh, Dr. Goldfarb's finding about uh, adolescent and young adult um, uh, uh, survivors is, you know, was there differences according to age category? So individuals under 40 uh, versus uh, older individuals, was there a difference in gender? And a lot of the qualitative research is now kind of recognizes this whole role of gender. So um, in terms of the importance of actually even reporting um, was what was the gender of the interviewer? Because that can actually potentially impact um, the responses depending on the gender of the interviewee. So I think there's a lot of very interesting things that could be looked at this. When the uh, quotes were provided, we have participant numbers, but we don't actually have sort of an age range or gender, and, and maybe that would be some form of secondary analysis potentially uh, to see whether there may be some differences. And I'm think and and again, I'm kind of thinking more with regards to some of the quantitative literature from uh, Dr. Uh, Goldfarb. Now the conclusions, uh, I think this is a very important article that builds on the prior quantitative literature on unmet needs of thyroid cancer patients and survivors, as well as some other qualitative literature. Although, I, as I said, I didn't go into that because it wasn't really sort of designed to examine people uh, preoperatively as, as this study was. But the themes are common, in particular, uh, the importance of um, adequate information, um, psychosocial support, uh, not minimizing the diagnosis. Um, and uh, so I think these are all things that have sort of repeatedly been shown um, in the literature and this uh, study reinforces that. 
Um, and uh, I think that um, the other, uh, in, in the case of this paper, the authors really were focused on the patient-surgeon relationship and patient reassurance. I think that there may be um, a broader implication in the long run as well, uh, in terms of not just reassurance about in the short term relating to potentially the surgery, uh, but exploring sort of how, how optimization of this care experience can also influence long-term outcomes, including quality of life. And I think that, you know, the key message is really this study affirms that there a gap remains in providing thyroid cancer patients with the support that they perceive as being adequate in meeting their needs and optimizing their well-being. And I think it uh, behooves us to address that gap, uh, both in our clinical practice as well as uh, research, including uh, health services uh, delivery research. And that's um, all of my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Susan. Um, awesome presentations here. And um, I, I think uh, perhaps uh, what we should do is start off, if Susan wants to comment on Anna's uh, present or discussion here, uh, we'll give you the first shot here. Absolutely. Um, thank you. That was a fantastic discussion, and I think a really important um, overview too of you know the difference between qualitative and quantitative research because I think that qualitative research is something that's not done as much um, in, you know in the medical field as opposed to other areas of um, research it's interesting several of the things that you um, mentioned uh, as limitations we either got removed from the paper because a reviewer didn't want it um, or because um, it's something that we actually later looked at or are looking at. And so in general, you know, we did think that this was using grounded theory um, methodology. Um, in terms of the surgeon, you know, kind of counseling piece, um, we didn't um, video or audio record those. We are actually audio recording them now to take a look at that. Um, and I think it is a major piece, but I think ultimately we weren't trying to look at that specifically. So I think at the time um, we didn't know that we needed to perhaps be also uh, looking at what was being given in general. I think all of our providers that were part of the study, um, you know, have similar um, uh, sort of uh, practices with patients. So they all get, you know, a single sheet as well as a booklet that goes over thyroid cancer and the risks and things related to surgery. Um, you know, I think there's likely variability in amount of, you know, other informational, emotional type support. But I also think that to somewhat it's a strength if there is variability in that pre-experience, then we're going to see more variability in our patients. So if they all, you know, went through exactly the same thing, then we probably wouldn't have um, picked up uh, as much as we did. Um, and we, I do think looking at the role of other staff is, um, you know, important. Um, our nurses come in afterwards and go through um, some additional education um, after patients have consented for surgery. And certainly uh, there could be some differences uh, between that. Um, we actually did look at age and gender and didn't find anything um, in terms of the differences, but um, I think it's a little hard to see patterns when you only have 32 patients. Um, we later increased this cohort for, from a different study up to 85 and um, looked at a little bit of a different question um, and didn't see those. And then all of our interviewers, I hadn't actually had this thought, but it's a super great point, um, were female. Um, and so perhaps that did um, impact it. Um, in general, they all um, had background uh, in qualitative research. Um, and so I think they were at least well um, prepared for that type of thing. So thank you for all of your uh, comments. I think that they were um, really excellent. Great. Um, so both Anna and Susan, um, I wonder if you could comment. Obviously, there's a great variability in the starting point for patients, both in terms of their um, sort of psychosocial um, and, and emotional um, makeup uh, and, and how, how that influences uh, the delivery of information. Um, and then uh, the other major thing is uh, understanding perceptions as it relates to patients who come in with different levels of information, of understanding. Um, in particular, um, uh, in New York, we deal with patients who have undergone third and fourth consultations and how that influences their 
um, their exchange with a clinician um, and uh, and dealing with their unmet needs here. So maybe if you could just comment on uh, some of those points. Yeah, I'm, I you know I think it can be uh, challenging. Um, there are several researchers who are trying to help identify patients with you know single questions. So they do have like a single question health literacy screener that's about asking people how much um, help they need you know interpreting. Uh, health related information, whether they can do it on their own or somebody helps them. Um, and there's now actually like a single question someone had put in the in the um, chat about minimizing and maximizing. And in general, you know, people who maximize healthcare are tend to be more anxious and nervous, which we know is associated with decreased information recall. Um, you know, uh, where you can just ask someone, you know, do you tend to like you know, take, uh, are you more likely to kind of watch and see, or are you more likely to take action um, when you're, you're doing care? And I think a lot of us have sort of learned how to triage patients in our head without being direct, but I do think it's important to ask them directly because someone may, you may have misinterpret how they feel, um, you know, but I think it's, you know, definitely a challenge because there is so much variability in patients, um, but trying to get an actual sense by, I think, asking them, um, about their sort of information preferences and those sorts of things and giving them time to ask questions is really important. There's a, a fascinating question that uh, one of our attendees has brought up about um, uh, the current environment in which we're uh, trying to meet um, the needs of patients uh, through telemedicine. Uh, perhaps you can just comment on that. Yeah, for, um, for myself, at least, one of the things I've um, found is a challenge in connecting with them, right? Um, and one of the things that we have done um, is bring a lot of those people back in person when we know they're definitely going to have surgery um, so that you can provide information, I think, in a, in a better way. I had a consultation with someone yesterday who was in their car on a farm trying to go put up tree stands to go hunting. Um, but I at least found that I could connect with him because we had a whole discussion about, you know, hunting and I knew enough background that that I think developed, you know, some rapport and actual trust with the patient. Um, but I do think that um, the more we can provide people with written information outside of uh, the actual visit or bring them back in person so they have a second um, visit, there are some studies that show that that sort of second type visit supports decision making in terms of it gives people a longer amount of time to think about exactly what they um, do want and kind of think about their true uh, values um, in that. I don't know if Dr. Saka has any thoughts. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the other thing is as much as we can uh, support, like really it's kind of been in a research context for us, but uh, providing patients with uh, written information and you can also, uh, uh, depending on your privacy situation, we have some ways we can do that with password protected links and things. Um, uh, providing uh, written information that's in plain language. Um, previously, when we did a qualitative study looking at information needs um, related to radioiodine, that was really something that was important for patients is to have something that they could print out in plain language, talk to their family, talk to their family doctor. And so I think that's important. Um, uh, other computerized uh, uh, information is also helpful or, or apps, so um, uh, links to um, uh, thyroid organizations, uh, information uh, from their decision aids, et cetera, which would you know, obviously need to be uh, developed depending on the situation. So I think those kind of other supplemental information are helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, if you are fortunate enough to have someone like a, uh, a nurse navigator or a nurse assistant, it was a very interesting study from McGill published in the last year where actually they had instituted a nurse navigator and, and who actually was there to sort of facilitate some communication and answering questions. And it actually did improve out, um, health outcomes in their patients. Um, so I think that, you know, really, uh, it, it, the doctor is is very important in whatever me, medium we can communicate with patients. Ideally, you know, we all I think prefer in person. Sometimes we can't, um, uh, but also sort of tapping into um, other sort of uh, virtual means as well as uh, if uh, other healthcare uh, professionals that we may be able to collaborate with. Great. Let me, um, in, in the two minutes remaining here, perhaps both of you could just comment. Um, we've identified unmet needs and some of the challenges that 
our thyroid cancer patient uh, population experience. What are you doing in your, from a training perspective, in terms of trying to um, uh, instill skill sets or um, uh, or, or um, other uh, helpful tools that you're giving your trainees in order to be able to identify and relate better to uh, their future patient population? I th that's a really excellent um, question and point. I think it's hard, especially with um, COVID, because the trainees are getting pulled in different directions. Um, our group as a research, um, on the research side, is actually looking at developing a program to help um, people with their emotionally um, supportive communication. You know, I think some of us like naturally um, have this reassuring demeanor and connect patients really easily. And some of that's a personality thing and you can't totally change someone's personality, but I think you can train specific skills and tell people, you know, these key phrases are actually really important. Um, you know, patients, you know, identify with them and kind of study that. So we're looking at that um, as well as um, also providing patients with very, um, uh, patient designed uh, simple information and in plain language that they understand um, but I think it's a challenge with the trainees because it's hard to even get them in clinic sometimes because um, they have so many different priorities. Great. Anna do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah I agree like I mean it's obviously uh, trainees uh, the whole trainee experience is modified now by COVID so I guess is the pre-COVID and, and the current life um, I, from my standpoint, I, I don't really train per se the uh, surgical um, uh, trainees, so uh, they may come to my clinic or, or something, but I, I, so I can't really comment on the uh, surgical um, uh, head and neck or endocrine surgery uh, programs. With the endocrine trainees, I think it really uh, does boil down to sort of um, clinical experience. We don't really have a dedicated sort of I don't know if they do it through the um, university at an earlier point in training in terms of communication skills. I think they do in medical school, but I, I think that there would be some benefit in terms of some kind of standardized training, particularly relating to um, cancer patients, including endocrine cancer patients. And um, I know when trainees have sometimes come to my clinic, they're like, well, I've never kind of talked about all that stuff before in any other clinic. So uh, I'm, I'm not just endocrine, but other oncology clinics. So I think that there, there does need to be some more attention. It's probably even beyond our field, actually. Um, uh, but I'm not a, uh, you know, educator, researcher person. So I personally have not developed anything, but I think there definitely is a role for something like that. Terrific. Well, listen, unfortunately, we are pushing the nine o'clock hour and um, I want to thank you both for really an outstanding presentation. I want to thank all of our attendees for joining us and um, extremely important that I thank um, our partner Lilly Oncology for sponsoring this wonderful session this morning. Um, so everybody stay safe. Um, it's getting a little bit dicey out there uh, so please stay safe and um, just a reminder that because of the Thanksgiving holiday next week we will um, be back in two weeks here. Um, so thank you very much and um, everybody uh, be well. Thank you. Yes, thank you.